Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Heavenly Father, you said in your word that if we abide in you and your words abide in us, we will ask whatever we desire and it will be done for us. And because we desire, Lord, to honor you, to glorify you, to bear much fruits so that we will be your disciples. Lord, we ask you for wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask of you, and out of your mouth comes wisdom. Lord, we ask for knowledge and understanding because out of your mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Please, O oh Lord, open up your storehouse. Rain down upon us spiritual blessings so much that we don't even have room to receive it. Fill us to the full so that our cup will run over. Teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Open up your word that we may behold wondrous things out of it. Lord, you are the revealer of all things. Therefore, reveal your truth to us about the end of the age. Reveal your truth to us about the prophetic scriptures. Reveal your truth to us about how little Egypt, the daughter of Egypt, is none other than the United States of America. Make these truths evident to us in this teaching. May hardness of hearts be softened. May hearts of stone be replaced with hearts of flesh. May we not hold to pride and nationalism, but may our citizenship be firmly rooted in heaven from which comes our Savior, our help, and where we will be with you in the new Jerusalem forever. We are just strangers and pilgrims on this earth. This earth is not our home. Let us cast aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto the author and finisher of our faith, Yeshua HaMashiach, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now been exalted higher than the highest heavens and sits at the right hand of the power on high. Lord, we come before your throne prostrating, asking you these petitions in your wonderful name, praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, we ask it all. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And if you have missed the rapture, and somehow, because God has given you mercy, God has extended grace to you, even during this time of Jacob's trouble that you are now in, and somehow, some way, you have been led to this teaching, and you are hearing this teaching, what you must do because you are now left behind is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God in the flesh, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, the King of the Jews, the God of the whole earth, the Word made flesh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the one who came down on the clouds and rained down all those hailstones. You must accept him because there is a wrath that's even greater to come. You have seen only just a taste of his wrath, but the wrath that he has coming is going to last forever for everyone who is disobedient and rebellious. And if you take the mark of the beast, 666, you will be doomed to the second death forever. Therefore, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how terrible a state you are in, no matter what you are going through right now, your number one priority is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Call on him today because the end of all things is at hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord, family of God. I have so much to share, so many teachings that I have been working on, and uh, Lord willing, uh, I'll have a run of teachings uh, this week uh, and next week, And uh, because even in 
uh, the church that I serve at the Church of Yeshua HaMashiach, if the Lord tarries and the Lord wills, I have to preach about three times uh, during, the month of, during the month of March, which is uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, but praise God. Uh, but there's teachings that I want to do, and this is the first of many to come, Lord willing. And this teaching, I want to let the Holy Spirit demonstrate through the word of God how the United States of America fulfills the ancient prophecies in regards to Egypt. Now understand that there are many ancient nations in the prophetic scriptures, the Bible, which the United States of America fulfills. I've gone through many of those teachings in previous videos and I can't go through them today but understand that America is throughout the Bible. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. What has to happen is that people have to get out of their theological boxes that they have clung to, which were postulated by theologians who lived a thousand years ago, who were speaking about prophetic times, but they had no insight because the prophetic times a thousand years ago were totally different than the prophetic times that we are living in today. The prophetic times that we are living in today has called for the unsealing of the book because the final generation, the generation at the end would understand the total picture because we are the fig tree generation. And I'm not trying to disparage the theologians of old who have given us many great truths to cling to, which have been greatly edifying for practical living and for uh, how to uh, walk in this fallen world circumspectly and to uh, understand the deity of Christ and uh, all of uh, the great truths uh, that we know so well. But when it comes to the prophetic, when it comes to the end of the age, people who lived 700, 800, 900 years ago, uh, who spoke about things uh, that are happening in our day and age, uh, they were seen through a glass dimly because, for one, there was no United States of America, and therefore they did not understand what we understand today because America is throughout the Bible, and the number one uh, name for America in the Bible is, of course, Babylon the Great, Revelation chapter 17, verse 18 and 18. But in this teaching, I want to show you how America is also known as Egypt, and the president of America is also known as Pharaoh, and I'm going to demonstrate this through the signs of the times, and most importantly, through the Bible, because there's nothing new done under the sun, okay? This is scripture. This is, this is Bible. The Bible tells us, can there be anything said that this is new? No, because it was already long ago before us. That is why God says he declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying his counsel will stand and he will do all of his pleasure. You see, there is a pattern of Israel always going to Egypt when they are in trouble. It started with the father of our faith, Abraham. Remember in the Bible, way back in the book of Genesis, when there was a famine in the land of Canaan. What happened with Abraham? He went down to Egypt. God never told Abraham to go to Egypt. God told Abraham to go to the land of promise, to the land that I will show you. And he went there. He went to Canaan. But then there came a famine in Canaan. And without Abraham telling God what he was going to do, or consulting God about what he should do, Abraham took the initiative to go down to Egypt himself. And what happened when he went down to Egypt? Pharaoh looked at Sarah. Well, the servants of Pharaoh saw Sarah, his wife, and saw that she was beautiful. And then they brought Sarah into uh, Pharaoh's harem. And then as you read in the story, uh, you know, uh, um, God plagued the house of Pharaoh because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And finally, 
uh, you know, Abraham, he was scared. He said, that's my sister. Uh, and, uh, uh, he had said a, a little fib, but, a, a, a one little, uh, a, a lie is a lie. I mean, there's no such thing as a little fib. It's either the truth or it's a lie. And so, uh, when it was discovered that Sarah was really Abram's wife, uh, Pharaoh finally let, uh, Sarah go and she and Abraham united back together. And then they went back to, uh, the land of Canaan. That was the first instance of, uh, Israel going down into Egypt. And of course we know what happened when there came another famine, uh, during the time of Joseph, when he was the second in charge over all of Egypt. Okay. When he was the second in charge over all of Egypt, his brethren came down to Egypt because there was a famine, uh, the seven years of famine. And when that seven years of famine came, uh, Israel, the whole house of Israel were in the land of Egypt, settling in Goshen. And we know the rest of the story. They settled there and they multiplied. And then uh, after a number of years, there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and then put the children of Israel into bondage in Egypt. And of course, after that, the Exodus happened with Moses. And so there is a pattern of Israel always going down to Egypt for help. And in the prophetic scriptures in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and in Isaiah, which we're going to go over, we see that before the Babylonian invasion in the year 586, 587 BC, Israel again went down to Egypt for help. And this was disobedience to what God had told the house of Israel to do. God told the house of Israel not to go down to Egypt for help because Egypt would be of no help. But of course, the children of Israel were disobedient and many of them fled to Egypt and the prophecy was fulfilled. Egypt was no help when Nebuchadnezzar came through and destroyed uh, Jerusalem, destroying the first temple and uh, taking uh, the captives into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. This is history. You see, I'm establishing a pattern because today, 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 the nation of Israel, the house of Israel is again leaning upon a nation known as America, but in the Bible, is known as Egypt, amongst other names, including Babylon the Great. And history is repeating itself again. And I'm going to demonstrate through the scriptures how America is modern day Egypt. Now, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, the Bible tells us out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything is established. Well, I'm going to give you about four or five or six or seven witnesses to establish the fact that America is known as Egypt in the Bible, okay? Now, you're looking at this. Here goes uh, witness number one. You're looking at this map. This map is of Illinois, right in the heartland of America, okay? And here in the middle of America, uh, we see this dark shaded portion, which is called Little Egypt. This is Southern Illinois. And you see that there's even a city named Cairo here in Southern Egypt, Southern uh, Illinois, which is known as Little Egypt. And we're gonna see right now, when we go to Wikipedia, where this name, Little Egypt, came from. Okay, so let's go to Southern Illinois. Here goes the Wikipedia. Southern Illinois, also known as Little Egypt, is the Southern third of the state of Illinois. Now let's go down here to the uh, article origin of Little Egypt name. In 1799, Baptist minister John Badgley dubbed the fertile highlands and bottoms near Edwardsville the land of Goshen. Early Edwardsville was known as Goshen. This was a biblical reference to Egypt. Geographic features such as the Mississippi and its floodplains were like the fertile Nile Valley. The Indian mounds of the area were large at the time and seemed like the pyramids of Egypt. The nickname stuck and was reinforced by other events. So here we see 
that this is history. This is American history. This nickname of Little Egypt has been around for hundreds of years, since 1799, okay? And uh, this southern part of Illinois, with the nickname Little Egypt, is one witness that America is the Egypt that we read about in the Bible in regards to the end times prophecies. That's one witness. What's the second witness? The dollar bill. On the very money that we in America use, and which is the money that is pretty much accepted all over the world, uh, because America is, of course, the leader of the world, which in the Bible, Egypt was the leader of the world, and Pharaoh was the leader of the world as the king, quote unquote. Well, America is, of course, the leader of the world, and the president is, of course, the known as the leader of the free world. And the world marches to the drumbeat of what America does and says. Okay, there's no, like, argument about that. So right there, in and of itself, that's another witness, okay, uh, that America is also Egypt, okay, because they both are uh, the number one nations in the world during their time. And so here we see on the dollar bill, uh, the pyramid with, of course, the all-seeing eye, and that's uh, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer, the enemy. And we see that the uncapped pyramid uh, is giving us uh, the plans for the new world order. Because when this all-seeing eye, and he doesn't have an all-seeing eye, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Only God sees all. But, you know, the enemy, he has a network of demons that work with him and all the fallen angels who work with him. And uh, they work in concert together in order to deceive the world. And so uh, the New World Order, uh, when the capstone uh, comes and the pyramid is completed, uh, is when uh, the enemy is going to be revealed, okay? And the plans for that have been on the dollar bill in our very pockets with uh, this great seal. Okay, and so where do they get this pyramid from? Of course, the pyramid comes from Egypt. Okay, so that's witness number two. Okay, here goes the third witness. The biggest, the world's tallest obelisk in all of the world. Okay, it's a big world out there. <laughs> the earth is big. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Okay, it's a big world out there. But the biggest, the tallest obelisk in all the world where else would it be except in the capital of america come on i mean are you serious <laughs> the washington monument is an obelisk on the national mall in washington dc built to commemorate george washington it is both the world's tallest predominantly stone structure and the world's tallest obelisk you can't make this up Okay, this is this we're, we're talking about facts. We're not talking about rabbits being pulled out of the hats. Okay, we're not we're not just making stuff up. This, this is facts. Pull out a dollar bill if you got one in your pocket and look at the Great Seal. You'll see a pyramid. Go to Washington, D.C. You'll see the world's tallest obelisk. Go to southern Illinois and you'll be in a place known as Little Egypt with the very city even named Cairo. If that's not enough, I pray that this would seal the deal before we get to the scriptures, because the scriptures are going to seal the deal. Hallelujah. But I want to bring out this final witness, okay, to let us know that this is ordained by God, okay? This is ordained by God. You can't argue with this last fact. I mean, if you want to argue about, you know, Southern Illinois being known as Little Egypt, okay. If you want to argue about, okay, uh, the pyramid being on the back of the dollar bill, okay. If you want to argue about the world's tallest obelisk being located in the capital of Washington, D.C., okay. But you cannot argue when the heavens speak. <laughs> Ah, hallelujah. The heavens rule, okay? You cannot argue with this last witness before we get to the word of God. Because you definitely can't argue with the word of God. Hallelujah. But people still do. Sad but true. But let's go to this final witness. 
When is the next eclipse.com? <laughs> only God can do this. Oh, only God can do this. This is God's hand on this. This is God's hand telling us exactly who America is. Okay. The crux of the eclipses. Little Egypt's seven year itch. <laughs> A reservoir near Carbondale, Illinois is about to experience the first of two totalities in 2017 before another in 2024. If you stand in one place on earth for 360 years, you will on average see one total solar eclipse. The law of averages, however, breaks down completely over the next seven years as the town of Carbondale, Illinois in the USA will experience two blackouts in that short period. Why does the Carbondale area referred to as Little Egypt get such a celestial jackpot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God is in charge. The heavens do rule. Hallelujah. You see, <laughs> God has marked little Egypt by the town of Carbondale. You see it right here. You see it right here. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Carbondale in the area of Southern Illinois, which has been nicknamed Little Egypt. Right here, the eclipse in 2017 cut across from the west to the east. And in 2024, uh, the other eclipse is going to cut across and it's going to cross right over the same place that the 2017 eclipse passed over, right in the very area known as Little Egypt. And what does an eclipse do? The eclipse that we see, a total solar eclipse, it brings darkness. It brings darkness over the land. It brings darkness over the land. This is God prophesying to us through the heavens according to what he told us he would do in Genesis chapter 1. What did he promise the heavenly bodies would be for? They would be for signs. They would be for signs. They would be for signs. The solar eclipses, which make an X. It literally makes an X. <laughs> it literally makes an X over America. It crosses America out with darkness right over Southern Illinois, which is known as Little Egypt. Now tell me that America is not known as Little Egypt or as what the Bible would say, the daughter of Egypt. Now, let's go to the scriptures, hallelujah. Let's go to the scriptures. Let's go to the scriptures so that we can see that God has a sacrifice, okay? God has a sacrifice. And on the day of his sacrifice, Egypt is going to be dealt with a very heavy blow, a blow so heavy that God is going to call all the fowls of the heavens and all the beasts of the earth to come and devour all of the slain. Okay, you see, God has a sacrifice on the cloudy day, a sacrifice in the day of the Lord. And I'm going to prove something right now, because as I like to say, and as you know, God is in the details. Hallelujah. God is in the details. And I'm going to talk about this sacrifice. 
this sacrifice that God has prepared in the day of the Lord, which begins with the fall of the United States of America, known in the Bible as many names, most prominently Babylon the Great. But she also fulfills what's going to happen in the prophecies when God speaks about Egypt. And let us go to the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah chapter one. Look at this. Verse 7, the day of the Lord, hold your peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guest. <laughs> oh, do you know who the guests are? The guests are all the fowls of the heavens and all the beast of the field. What's going to happen in that day? Verse 8, And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also I will punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and an howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Mactesh! For all the merchant people are cut down, all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles. <laughs> why, why is God searching Jerusalem with candles when this sacrifice comes? Because there's darkness in the land. The night has come when no one can work. It's the cloudy day. Oh, yeah. It's a terrible day, my friends. And punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty and the houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. It's a cloudy day, my friends, you see. And God says when this day comes, the day of the Lord, God has prepared a sacrifice. And so let's get to this sacrifice because I want to show how everything matches. And so when we talk about this sacrifice that God has prepared, I want to first bring about what you may already know about this sacrifice, which is the battle of Gog and Magog, okay? Because I want to prove how the fall of America is connected to this same day, which we're going to discover in the Bible is known as Egypt as well, okay? So let's go to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel. I pray that you're with the teaching. I pray that you're still following. We're still talking about Egypt, but I, I, we got to bring everything together because there's many moving parts, okay? That's why God said we have to go line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Okay, this isn't Gerber food. This isn't no baby formula. This is strong meat, okay? But people don't want strong meat. They want people to prophesy unto them smooth things. They want them to be prophesied with deceits. They don't want to hear the word of the Lord. They don't want to hear uh, the word of the Most High. They want to hear a tickling message of peace. They want MAGA 
Let's make America great again. They want to hear visions of peace. Oh, but God talks about that. He talks about those false prophets who say visions of peace when there is no peace. But let's get to this sacrifice because this sacrifice, remember, Zephaniah, God says when the day of the Lord comes, God has a sacrifice, okay? So we know exactly when this sacrifice comes, when the day of the Lord begins. And when the day of the Lord begins, we're going to see that it's connected to the battle of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 39, verse 1. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you back and leave but the sixth part of you and will cause you to come up from the north parts and will bring you upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite your bow out of your left hand and will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. Look at this, verse 4. Here comes the sacrifice. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all the bands and the people that is with you. I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beast of the field to be devoured. You shall fall upon the open field for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, Babylon the Great, a.k.a. Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so here we get the first mention of the ravenous birds of every sort and the beasts of the field that are coming to devour on this day. Furthermore, we're going to get it right out in plain language. <laughs> right here, here comes the sacrifice. Verse 17, Ezekiel 39, and you, son of man, Thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you. <laughs> Even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus you shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. That's the day of the sacrifice, my friends, when all the feathered fowls and all the beasts of the field are assembled. And it happens in the day when Gog and Magog is judged, which happens in conjunction with the day of the Lord, according to Zephaniah. Now, how does America fit into this? How does the postulation that you said earlier, how America is the fulfillment of all the ancient prophecies of Egypt, fall into this? Well, I'm glad you asked, because... The prophetic scriptures also tell us about this sacrifice where all the fowls of the heavens and all the beasts of the earth are going to be gathered in order to devour the armies of Pharaoh and Egypt. Ezekiel 29, let's start there. There's just so much to say about it, but let's start in Ezekiel 29. Ezekiel 29, look at this. Look at this judgment against Pharaoh. The judgment against Pharaoh. Now remember, what is America doing? America is trying to bring peace, a vision of false peace, a false report, and Israel is hook, line, and sinker with America. Look at that. Look at the headlines with Netanyahu. Netanyahu, the, the prince of Judah, okay? He's known as one of the princes of Judah, okay? He's actually the prime minister, as you know. And there's an election coming up next week. 
Okay, I think March the second. And so we'll see what happens of that. But as you can see, they're making preparations about annexing the West Bank because of the Trump peace plan. Netanyahu Israeli officials meet with U.S. mapping team for West Bank annexation. They're meeting with the United States, okay, because the United States was the one who put out the peace plan. Look at this. The U.S. members uh, of the committee formed to map out areas of the West Bank that Israel plans to annex as part of the Trump administration's peace plan met Monday with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other senior officials as they pressed ahead with the project. Okay, so America is the fulfillment of the prophecies in regard to Egypt because Israel is again going after Egypt, which is America. Israel is not going after the Lord. Israel is going after America, which fulfills the ancient prophecies of Egypt. Now look at this, Ezekiel 29. Now remember, before we get to this, that there was always a near fulfillment, okay? This literally, literally happened during the time of Jeremiah with the Babylonian captivity, okay? I already mentioned that earlier in this, early in this teaching, but I got to mention it again so that we don't lose track, we don't lose focus. But remember, there's a, also a far fulfillment to prophecy. There's multiple fulfillments to prophecy, just like in Hosea. Remember in Hosea when uh, the prophet Hosea said, out of Egypt I have called my son? Well, that was a multiple fulfillment. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. But then remember, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, when he was born into this world, Herod was trying to kill all of the babies two years and under. So what did God tell Joseph and Mary to do? He told Joseph and Mary to go down to Egypt. And what happened? Jesus was safe in Egypt until God called them back to Israel. And Hosea prophesied about that. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Israel is God's son. And of course, the only begotten son of God is none other than Jesus Christ. Multiple fulfillments. That's just one example out of many. I'm saying that to say this. We can't lose track of the fact that, yes, much of this, some of it was fulfilled during the days of the Babylonian captivity. But because history repeats itself, there is also a end of the age fulfillment which will be fulfilled with the destruction of America, which is Egypt. And Pharaoh is the president of America. No ands, ifs, or buts about it. Israel is going to America for help instead of going to the Lord for help. The same mistake that they made in ancient days when they went to Egypt for help instead of going to God for help. It's a repeat of history. Nothing new done under the sun. Now look at this. Ezekiel 29, verse 1. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, which have said, my river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Verse four, here goes the key, it's coming, look at this. But I will put hooks in your jaws, and I will cause the fish of your rivers to stick into your scales, and I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, and all the fish of your rivers shall stick unto your scales. Verse five, and I will leave you thrown into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You shall fall upon the open fields. You shall not be brought together nor gathered. I have given you for meat to the beast of the field and to the fowls of the heaven. That's the sacrifice, my friends. The same sacrifice that God has prepared in the day of the Lord. The same sacrifice where he has bid his guest. The same sacrifice that we read about in Ezekiel 39. When God calls all the fowls of the heavens and all the beasts of the field to devour the armies of Gog and Magog. Well, Pharaoh and Egypt 
is also going to fall on this same day. Because remember, in Ezekiel 38, God also puts hooks into the jaws of Gog and Magog. We see that in Ezekiel uh, 38. Ezekiel 38 says this. Remember, Ezekiel 38. Just I'm going to show you the connections. Here we go. Ezekiel 38, verse 4. And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws. And I will bring you forth and all your armies, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So God not only puts a hook into the jaws of Gog and Magog to bring them against the land of Israel, God says he also puts a hook into the jaws of Pharaoh and all of his fishes and brings them out of the rivers, okay? All the fishes are all the inhabitants of the land of Egypt, which is, of course, America that we're talking about, Pharaoh being the president, okay? So when God puts the, the hooks into the jaws of Gog and Magog, God is also putting hooks into the jaws of Pharaoh and Egypt. And the same destruction is going to come upon Pharaoh and Egypt that comes upon Gog and Magog. And God will have his sacrifice, which the guest being the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven. And why? Here, here comes the reason, verse 6. And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of you by the hand, you did break and rend all their shoulders. When they leaned upon you, you breakest and made all their loins to be at a stand. This is an allusion to Egypt's weakness as an ally and the worthlessness of Egypt's protection over Israel. Israel is so foolish to rely on Egypt for protection. They should have turned to God for their security and strength. In the Trump peace plan, the 181 pages that Benjamin Netanyahu whooped it up, hooped it up, and, and said, yeah, it's a good plan. And uh, all of those leaders, all those princes who are in the Oval Office or in the White House when this peace plan was presented on January 28, 2020, they were all clapping and yupping it up. But in the 181 pages of that peace plan, there was no mention of Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of the Jews. There was no mention of the Prince of Peace. There was no mention of the God of Israel. There was no mention of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Instead, it was all about what Trump was going to do. It was all about what America was going to do. How America was going to give $50 billion to the Palestinians. Give them Al-Quds, which is another name, the Arabic name for East Jerusalem, so that they can have a capital for a new so-called Palestinian state. Visions of peace. It's a false report propagated by false prophets. And Israel is relying on America just like they did in years past when they went to Egypt and relied on Egypt. But Egypt, which is modern day America, will be no help. Egypt, which is modern day America, will be no help. Let's keep on going because we're just getting started. We're just getting started. You see, let me, let, let's go, let's go to chapter 30. Let's see what chapter 30 says about this. The lament for Egypt. Verse one, the word of the Lord came again unto me saying, son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, how ye woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. <laughs> it's the day of the Lord. 
the day of the Lord, when God said in Zephaniah that he has prepared a sacrifice and he has bid his guest. Oh, well, God says in Ezekiel chapter 30 that when the day of the Lord comes, it's a cloudy day. And what happens when that cloudy day comes? Verse 4. And the sword shall come upon Egypt. Oh, let's go to more scriptures. Isaiah chapter 19. What does Isaiah chapter 19 tell us about this cloudy day? The burden concerning Egypt. Verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. <laughs> it's the same day, my friends. The cloudy day, according to Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 3, when the day of the Lord begins, is the same day that Isaiah prophesied about when the burden of Egypt comes. And the Lord rides upon a swift cloud. And when the Lord rides upon a swift cloud, where is he coming to? He's coming into Egypt. And all the idols of Egypt are going to be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Oh, it's a terrible day. But let's go. Let's keep on going. Because uh, there's so much to say. Because when this day comes... When this day comes, when this day comes, when the sacrifice is prepared, look at what happens. Look at what happens to Egypt. I, I, I got to keep on going. I can't go through all of Ezekiel 30. We got to get to the next chapter. Let's get to the next chapter because this is, it keeps on going. This is all about Egypt. Egypt is going to fall like Assyria. And so here we have a mention of how Egypt is likened unto a great tree. And this great tree is going to be chopped down by God. And when this great tree is chopped down by God, we see the sacrifice again in Ezekiel chapter 31. Let's just do a couple verses so you get the context. And it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in your greatness? So this is all about Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to his multitude, meaning all the people who live in Egypt, which is, of course, modern-day America, Babylon the Great. Here, now let's jump down to, let's jump down to verse 10. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have lifted up yourself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off, and have left him upon the mountains, and in all the valleys his branches are fallen, and his bows are broken by all the rivers of the land, and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow, and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. There's the sacrifice. All the fowls of the heavens and all the beasts of the field. They're all coming to devour when the day Egypt falls, which is connected to when the day of the Lord begins and also connected to the battle of Gog and Magog. You see? You see, this is that same day. It's all the same day, which the Bible tells us is the day of sudden destruction. Verse 18, to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shall you be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh in all his multitude, saith the Lord God. On the day of sudden destruction, the president of the United States, known as Pharaoh, here in the prophecies, is going to die. 
him and everyone else who was left behind in America. It's the day of sudden destruction. Look at this. You don't believe me? Let God be true and all men liars. Look at verse, look at Ezekiel 32. This is going to hammer it home. This is going to hammer it home right here. Verse 1. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, You are like a young lion of the nations, and you are as a whale in the seas. And you camest forth with your rivers, and troublest the waters with your feet, and foulest the rivers. Thus saith the Lord God, I will therefore spread out my net over you with a company of many people, and they shall bring you up in my net. That's the trap. God has set a trap for America. When speaking about Babylon, God says, I have set a trap for you, O Babylon, and you are taken. It happens suddenly. It's right here again in connection with the fall of Egypt. And Pharaoh, God is the one who does this. God says, I'm the one who's going to spread the net. I'm the one who's going to set the trap. I'm the one who's going to cause your destruction. Verse 4, here comes the sacrifice again. Then will I leave you upon the land. I will cast you forth upon the open field and will cause all the fowls of the heaven to remain upon you. And I will fill the beast of the whole earth with you. That's the same day, the same day of the sacrifice. It's the same structure. All the fowls of the heavens and all the beasts of the earth, they come to devour at the time when Egypt is destroyed, which is America. And also when Gog and Magog happens. It's the same day, which is the beginning of, of the day of the Lord. Now look at this. This is going to hammer it home. Let's keep on reading. Verse 5. And I will lay your flesh upon the mountains and fill the valleys with your height. I will also water with your blood the land wherein thou swimmest, even to the mountains, and the rivers shall be full of you. Verse 7. Here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the home run. Okay. Verse 7. And I shall, and when I shall put you out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with the cloud, the cloudy day, and the moon shall not give her light. This is the day of the Lord. This is the fourth trumpet when everything turns dark. One third of the stars are darkened. One third of the sun is darkened. One third of the moon is darkened. This is when Jesus Christ comes down upon the clouds. This is when darkness comes upon the whole earth. Okay. Verse 8. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and set darkness upon your land, saith the Lord God. The solar eclipse is the sign of what's coming to America. Seven years apart, the number of completion, the number of perfection. God has marked out little Egypt. Only God can do this. He didn't do it over Buenos Aires, Argentina. He didn't do it over Kenya. He didn't do it over Beijing. He didn't do it over Sydney, Australia. He didn't do it over anywhere else except the United States of America in a place known in Southern Illinois as Little Egypt. He darkened it. This is what's coming. It's a prophecy that God gave us in real time. We saw it in 2017. We saw the first eclipse. We saw how it passed over America, going over seven different cities named Salem, starting in the 33rd state, ending on the 33rd parallel. It was all ordained by God. God is telling us what's coming. Darkness is coming to the land, my friends. Darkness is coming to the land, my friends. Verse 8, all the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and set darkness upon your land. It's the cloudy day. It's the cloudy day, the day of the Lord. But there's people left behind. Look at verse 9. I will also vex the hearts of many people 
when I shall bring your destructions among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at you, and their king shall be horribly afraid for you, when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life in the day of your fall. It's the time of Jacob's trouble for everyone who is left behind. It's the time of the heathen. Okay. It's the cloudy day, my friends. There's still people left behind. There's still a seven-year tribulation that has to go on. This is just the beginning. Okay. <laughs> this is just the beginning of the day of the Lord. Okay. Now look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at who falls down into the pit with Egypt. They're all going to hell. I'm not going to mince my words. I will not mince my words because these are the words of God. Look what happens when Egypt falls. They are, everyone who falls on this day with Egypt, they're all going to hell. That's the fourth seal. The rider on the pale horse is death and hell follows with him. Verse 17, and it came to pass in the 12th year in the 15th day of the month that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations unto the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. They're all going to hell. It's the day of the Lord. It's judgment. It's judgment day. Okay. I'm not going to mince words. If you're not caught up in the rapture, you're liable to the rider on the fourth horse. And if you are in America on this day and you're not caught up, you're going to hell. You will not survive. Everyone in America who's left behind on the cloudy day dies. That's it. That's all. Verse 19. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down and be thou laid with the uncircumcised. Okay. You ain't circumcised in your heart, in your spirit. You're not getting into the Father's house. You're dead, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, the second death. Woe unto your soul. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell. With them that help him, they are gone down. They lay uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Look who's there. Look who's there. Look who falls with the people on this day. The people of Egypt along with Pharaoh. Asher is there. That's Assyria. Look at this, verse 24, who's, a, who's also falling on that day? There is Elam, that's Iran, <laughs> that's Iran, that's Gog and Magog, Elam's there. Verse 26, who also is there? There's Meshach and Tubal, that's Gog and Magog, okay? It's the same day, it's the same day. Elam falls on that day, Assyria falls on that day, Meshach and Tubal falls on that day. Let's read it, there is Meshach, Tubal. And all her multitude, her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living. And they shall not lie with the mighty, they are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. And they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquity shall be upon their bones. Though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living, Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and shall lie with them that are slain with the sword. Okay, it's the same day as Gog and Magog. It's all the same day. We just saw it right here. Elam is Iran. That's Jeremiah 46. Oh, that's not Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49, look at this. Jeremiah 49, here goes the judgment upon Elam. The judgment upon Elam happens when God comes down upon the clouds, when he sets his throne in Elam. Judgment on Elam, verse 34, Jeremiah 49. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, that's the four horsemen, and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. 
For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. And I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there the king and the princes, saith the Lord. When God comes on the clouds, his throne is coming on uh, upon Elam. Okay, it's the same day. It's all the same day. Gog and Magog is connected to the fall of America. It's all that same day, which is when the day of the Lord begins and when the sacrifice of the Lord is performed, when he calls for all the beasts of the earth and all the fowls of the heavens to come and devour all the carcasses. And for everyone who dies, God tells us that they go down into the pit. Okay? Egypt is there, along with Pharaoh. Assyria is there. Elam is there. Meshach and Tubal is there. Edom is there. Okay. The princes of the north, all of them and all the Sidonians are there. Okay. Verse 31, Pharaoh shall see them. <laughs> That's the president of the United States. Hey, you want to say he's a Christian man? Hey, go ahead. The Bible tells me different. Okay. The Bible says he's going to hell. Pharaoh shall see them. You better pray for him. I'll pray for him. I'll pray that he repents. But it's the end of the age. I don't know. I don't know from what the Bible says. Pharaoh dies and goes to hell. Pharaoh being the president of America. Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude. Even Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, saith the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living. And he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword. Even Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. This is the word of the Lord. I'm not going to argue with the word of the Lord. This is what God says. This is what God says. Okay. This is what God says. This is going to happen on the cloudy day. I pray that you understood some of this. Because... It's interesting that the next chapter is the watchman chapter. The watchman who has to blow the horn to announce these things. And the message that has been given is a hard message. A hard message that not many people want to sound the trumpet to. They want to hear visions of peace. But there is no peace, saith my God unto the wicked. This is not a comforting message if you do not know Jesus. This is a sound of the trumpet to watch out, to repent and believe the gospel because Egypt is going to dis be destroyed. Egypt is going to be caught in the net of the Lord. Egypt is going to be destroyed. Darkness is going to come upon Egypt. And that darkness is the total destruction of the whole land. Pharaoh and all the people who are left behind inside America because they weren't caught up, are going to die. They're going to die. They're going to die. And they're going to go down to hell. That's it. That's all. So what are we to do? We are to continue to warn the people that this is about to happen. America is dividing the land of Israel. Cutting Israel up like it's some science project. God says if you touch the nation... The very city where he has placed his name, you are going to be cut up yourself into three parts. You can read about it in Revelation. Uh, America is going to be cut up into three parts and the sea is going to cover her totally destroyed by fire. Pharaoh and everyone who's left behind, meaning the president and all those who are inside of America are going to die. They're all going to die, and they're going to go to hell. That's what the rider on the fourth horse tells us. Now, to say one last thing so that you do not get confused, you have to make a distinction between the sacrifice that comes on the day of the Lord when it begins, when God comes on the white cloud, from the sacrifice. Well, it's actually not a sacrifice. It's the Great Supper. The Great Supper that happens when Jesus Christ comes on the white horse, okay? Because this, this goes into how God is in the details, okay? There's also a great supper 
when Jesus Christ returns on the white horse, the rider on the white horse at the end of the seven year tribulation. Okay, verse 11, and I saw a heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Okay, so this is when we uh, as the body of Christ are following him on white horses and this is at the battle of Armageddon when he's coming to establish the kingdom on the earth. What's going to happen? Verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourself unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Okay? Verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Do you see the details? At the time of the supper of the great God, which happens at Armageddon, this is different than the sacrifice that is prepared when he comes on the white cloud. Because when he comes on the white cloud for the sacrifice that he has bid his guests for, his guests are not just the fowls of the heavens, but also the beast of the earth. Did you see the details? It's not just the fowls of the heavens. It's also the beast of the earth. We went through about four or five scriptures uh, that showed us that. Let me just show you this again, and then I'll be done. Verse 4, Ezekiel 32. Then I will leave you upon the land. I will cast you forth upon the open field and will cause all the fowls of the heaven to remain upon you. And I will fill the beast of the whole earth with you. Okay, so at the time of the sacrifice, it's not just the fowls of the heaven, but it's also the beast. The beast of the earth also devour. It's two, the fowls and the beast. When Jesus Christ comes on the clouds at the time of the rapture, when the day of the Lord begins, when America is destroyed, when Gog and Magog is destroyed, when the time of Jacob's trouble begins. That's the day of the sacrifice, when the fowls of the heavens and the beast of the earth come to devour. Seven years later, when the heavens are open and Jesus Christ returns on a white horse, there is a great supper that God has prepared. And for this great supper that God has prepared, only the fowls of the heavens are invited. Verse 17, Revelation chapter 19. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Again, verse 21, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter is established. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. No mention of the beast. No mention of the beast of the earth. No mention of the beast of the earth coming to the supper of the great God at the battle of Armageddon. Only the fowls. So you have to see the details to understand the differences so that we're not confused because God is in the details. God is in the details. Again, he's demonstrated how the details matter so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. The supper of the great God, would hap which happens at Armageddon, only the fowls of the heavens are invited. When Jesus Christ comes on the white cloud, when the day of the Lord begins at the time of the rapture, the fowls of the heaven and the beast of the earth come to devour. Same thing we saw in Ezekiel 39, with Gog and Magog. And then I'm done. Verse 17, Ezekiel 39. And you, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Okay? 
I pray that you got that. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, but just to say what the word of God says, I pray that this teaching was edifying. Uh, and I pray that you learn. I got some more to come back on here and talk about. This is just the beginning of a, a series of messages that I got to get out. Lots of stuff that I got to say. So I pray that you are blessed. And I pray that you know Jesus. He's coming soon. I love you. Maranatha. Amen.